and welcome everyone. My name is Paul Diaz. I'm the webinar production assistant from Dataversity. We would like to thank you for joining the latest installment of the monthly Dataversity webinar series, Advanced Analytics with William McKnight. Today, William will be discussing why organizations don't change when they need to. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Or if you'd like to tweet, we certainly encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag ADVAnalytics. If you would like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. Just click the chat icon in the bottom right corner for that feature. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing link, links to the slides, the recording of the session, and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, let me introduce you to our speaker for this series, William McKnight. William has advised many of the world's best-known organizations. His strategies form the information management plan for leading companies in numerous industries. He's a prolific author and a popular keynote speaker and trainer. He has performed dozens of benchmarks on leading database, data lake, streaming, and data integration products. William is a number one global influencer in data warehousing and master data management, and he leads the McKnight Consulting Group, which has twice placed on the incorporated 5,000 list. And with that, I'll give the floor to William to get today's webinar kicked off. Hello and well, welcome, William. Thank you, Paul. And welcome, everybody, to the last Advanced Analytics webinar of the year. And I am pleased to let you know that we'll be continuing through next year, so keep this spot marked on your monthly calendar. And we have a, a very exciting set of topics uh, next year, and I'll introduce those at the very end so that you can plan ahead. But today, I thought I'd kind of wrap up the year a little bit by talking about why organizations don't change when they need to, because I have heard that you've enjoyed the ideas presented throughout the course of the year, and of course you're getting ideas all over the place and forming them into projects for your companies and that we would like them to take up. And uh, I hear frustration at that point. I see frustration at that point. I have frustration at that point. Uh, and so I want to help you out with that part of it. So once you have a data-oriented project, okay, we'll get into some terms here, but once you have a great one formed for your company, one that will take them forward, one that they ought to do, at least in your view, um, there, is, there is definitely some time and uh, skill involved at that point to actually get it taken up. And truly, uh, that is a skill, and if you can get behind some great things that happen for your company, that is all but good uh, for you and the company. And so we want this. It's, it's no good for us to learn all these things, and then we never get to apply them within our company. Now, you're going to learn things you can't apply. There's no doubt about it. But if it's 100% of the things you learn, then that it can be a bit of a problem. And hopefully you are focused in the right direction. You're hearing about data lakes. You're hearing about artificial intelligence. You're hearing about streaming data, et cetera, graph databases. And you want these things in your company. You see a place for them. And truly, at least if you're a mid-sized or up company, I see a place for all that and more. Um, referring back to my maturity talk, I talked about that. I talked about master data management and the need for all of these things uh, somewhere. There's no one size fits all. But not to go back into all that, let's talk about why organizations don't change when they need to. And first, to let you know, I've helped justify some pretty large projects in the past few years, and these are some of them. And uh, while you may look at the, the big numbers there and say, wow, that's, that's a lot of money, of course, there's, there's been more, uh, there's been higher ones uh, in the past. Um, the thing is, today, um, I don't get this kind of budget, um, and I don't think really very many people get this kind of budget. These are just earmarked numbers in terms of how how far the project's going to go over the course of years. And that could be two years, that could be four years, could be five years. Um, but a, an initial like first year budget is probably on the order of five to ten million for something like this, and then it might ramp up to 
say, 15 million in the second year if the first year went well, and uh, you taper down uh, at some point as you get more into maintenance and settling mode and you've done most of what you can do. But a couple of these have actually completed the, the budgets that you see here over the course of years, and maybe three of them are still on the journey, but it looks like they will continue on the journey all the way to the earmarked number successfully. So, how did I have, how did I do this? How did this happen? I want to share some of that with you. And first to let you know, I had to wear my architecture hat and my business hat at the same time. And that's really a skill there that you need to have if you're going to be the champion of these great projects that exploit the number one asset of your company, which is data, enterprise data. You got to be able to wear both of these hats and you have to understand who you're talking to and what kind of hat that they expect that you have on at that moment. If you're talking to an executive, you better have your business hat on. If you're talking to someone in technology, you better have your architecture hat on and be speaking to their needs. And so it's a balancing act, it's a delicate act. And uh, I wanna give you some skills here today, or at least expose you to some ideas that you might want to look into further, some things that you may or may not have done for the great projects that you've thought of for your company. Or you may, you may not be the one thinking of the project, you may be the one helping the champion behind some of these projects. And so these are some things that you might be able to share with him or her so that you can get these great projects going. You can exploit the technology that you, uh, that you enjoy and want to. Let's say you come up with a great idea and the organization responds with a no. <laughs> now, I, I don't know that I've ever gotten a, a hard and fast no, maybe a few times in my career, but most of the time it's a soft no, okay? That's how it works. It's a soft no. It's a, well, what about this? What about that? It's sort of, you know, chase down some things and, and hopefully, it, you know, from their perspective anyway, hopefully it dies away and I, I'm not up to, uh, to standard. Uh, but I try to be, and I want you to be. And um, so that's sort of the genesis of a lot of the, uh, the material today, is to get past this, to answer those questions up front, because most of them are good questions that I should have answered, you should have answered. And so if we come in with the right perspective, we can uh, kind of jump ahead a little bit in the process. And by the way, I don't ever expect that when I offer up one of these, one of these you know, to a company, that it's going to be a straight up yes, yes. You have you have answered all our questions. It's it's a time consuming process. It's a back and forth. Uh, you have to bring a lot of patience. And I feel like a lot of times great ideas don't come with enough patience for a corporate machinations to uh, actually accept that project. And so that is something that we're going to talk about here now. So why? Why don't organizations accept your great ideas? Why don't they do what they need to do? Well, these are the top four in my view. Uh, one is ROI concerns. Now, not everything's about ROI, you know, hard number and so on, but oftentimes, oftentimes projects are, and they are from the very start. We're trying to save money here. We're trying to save on fraud. We're trying to, you know, get better uptake on our promotions. We're trying to uh, save on maintenance costs, et cetera, et cetera. These are all hard dollar items. And uh, in moments like this year, um, the world has kind of come back to uh, some of these hard dollar items. So there is definitely going to be room for the strategic, and I'm going to acknowledge that for sure. Um, but oftentimes projects start as, oh, it's strategic. And, you know, it's it's a you know a new market we got to break into and so on and and I'm all about that I'm gung ho about that uh, but when you start applying dollar figures to the cost of the project then the question starts getting asked about well where's the dollars where do the dollars get returned for this project and that's where your ROI skills can come into play so the more you can bring into that negotiation if you will uh, the better so I'm going to give you some uh, some skills here today we're not going to get deep into the math but we're going to do some. Credibility. Do they feel like you're the one to ch the, the, that is right to be championing championing this project? Um, I often say that you know all these great ideas that we come up with that organizations could actually use that most executives would yeah if they could snap a finger and have that project in production running the way you say it's going to run tomorrow 
uh, even for the dollar figure that you are asking for? The answer is yes, but they question the journey. They question whether you're the right person, whether your team is the right team, and some of the other things on here. So I want you to be con constantly building that, and I want you to understand about the patient part of this and how education is very important. That brings me to my third bullet, terminology. Our industry has not done a great job at standardizing terminology, you know, the data industry in general. So uh, oftentimes you're on one set of terminology, the counterparty is on a completely different set of terminology. I mean, I feel okay in these webinars to talk about data lakes and data warehouses and graph databases and stuff like that and not not then pause and take five minutes to explain what I'm talking about, unless I'm getting into a certain level of detail. And then I do, because then all our definitions that are, are kind of all forked off from one another, we have to be on the same page in order for me to take you to that level of detail in a webinar or in a consulting session or whatever. So the same is true for you as you're championing these projects. You have to be on the same page in terms of terminology, and that does require some education. And, you, and the organization, the person you're presenting this to, the champion, uh, or the you know who would be the executive sponsor, or offer up the budget, get behind it from an executive perspective, et cetera, uh, that person is concerned about his or her peers in the organization, and really is the rest of the organization going to do their part? And is this, this going to make priority for them? So let's we'll start addressing these four things as we go along here, and see if we can break through break some ground for you here. Okay, first, let's talk about ROI. Let's talk about acknowledging the strategic, okay? I'm not saying everything has to be our dollars, ROI. Uh, there's no room for projects that don't have an ROI associated to them. I'm not saying that at all. There is definitely a place for learning, a place for innovation. There's definitely a, a time for the unknown upside, you know, breaking into a new market. I'm, I'm pretty sure Elon Musk isn't, isn't saying, well, let's go to Mars and what's the ROI of that? Okay, but we're not all going to Mars, you know what I mean? Uh, we're, we're all doing uh, projects for uh, mostly major companies and mid-sized companies that, um, you know, they care about their dollars. They care about the bottom line, and that's okay. That's business. And um, these things are important, but <clears throat> oftentimes it comes down to the hard dollar. <clears throat> so we're going to acknowledge the intuitive thinking that will still need to be employed, by the highest person, highest paid person's opinions. Yeah, that's gonna stay there a little bit. All right, we have to divide up what we're doing into workloads. So what's a workload? Well, there's a skill involved at dividing up the workloads and, and determining what it is that you're actually talking about. Oftentimes we're in larger corporations, we cannot possibly be talking about projects that incorporate the whole organization, at least not at the very beginning. And what are these sheep that I'm putting behind fences here? What am I talking about? Well, it could be data. It could be users. It could be usage. It could be uh, availability of the system. There's a lot of things that can go into the workload. But ultimately, you need to be presenting great workloads to the organization and trying to get momentum around that. Now, is it going to be the perfect workload? No, never. Is it going to be good enough? Is it going to be great? Is it going to be something that takes the organization forward? I hope so. That's the kind of workload that we need to be uh, ring fencing here, if you will, and presenting back to the company. A lot of the things that I talked about in my maturity talk a few months ago. So if, uh, if you're not doing those things, those are things that you need to start, uh, being, start presenting appropriately into your company. Now, let's talk about ROI some more. Ordered benefits. This is what makes it difficult because very few of us are creating, let's say, a data warehouse and selling subscriptions to the data warehouse. And we can say, well, it costs as much to build a data warehouse, sort of the easy part, and we're going to sell this many subscriptions and they're going to pay this much and it's going to more than pay for the, the cost. So when you want to do that, we're not doing that. That's not, you know, anything. I, I've done that once, okay? Um, but once out of so many times, uh, we're probably not doing that. We're probably in the second or the third order of benefits that accrue from building that data structure, that data artifact, all right? And we have to understand the full chain. Yes, we. We the ones that, are, that come to webinars like this to learn about technology and architecture 
and data projects. Uh, we, we are getting more and more behind the projects of the company as the companies move towards data leadership, as the companies move towards being quote unquote data driven, then more of the focus for the complete uh, justification of the project falls on those of us with those skills. So we got to get our arms around all the ordered benefits. And yes, the first order is easy. The second order is hard. And the third order is harder still because you are now reaching out into different pockets of the organization, understanding what they're going to do with the data and how that's going to translate. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about terminology as we talk about ROI. Because, again, you've got to be on the same page. Are you justifying, I'm just using data warehousing as an example. Could be data lakes, could be maps, could be any of these things, streaming data, graph data, whatever. Um, speaking from a technology perspective, and that's a that's kind of a problem right there. I don't really want you doing that. I want you to be justifying the uh, predictive maintenance project that, oh, it happens to use the data warehouse. That's what I would rather you be justifying. But many of us speak in these terms, so I'm leaving it here for now, but do know that these projects should really be casted as business projects to the organization. And, oh, by the way, we're going to do it the right way. We're going to build a data warehouse uh, for it, for example. So are you just trying a project or a program? There's a big difference here. A project does something for the organization, something specific in, in support of a usage of that data warehouse, like predictive maintenance or targeted marketing or fraud detection or customer churn management. It's one of those things, okay? You're justifying that project, and oh, by the way, it happens to use the data warehouse, which is a great way to do it, as long as you're not building the data warehouse into a rat hole where it can't support anything else. That is, that's inefficient as you go forward. So that's, that leads me into justifying a data warehouse program. Maybe you have three or four different projects. They're already running, but they're, they're running with their own quote unquote data warehouse or database. The marketing database over here, you know, kind of resembles a, a data warehouse if you squint your eyes and that sort of thing. Maybe we ought to be getting those databases together and unifying them so that they're all not only singing from the same hymnal, but uh, we're also saving money in the, in the process. So that's a data warehouse program. So be sure when you're talking to someone in your company about the data warehouse, you're on the same page in regards to this fact. So a little bit more here, an information management program, which will store data for several projects. So therefore, the question on the table is, why should we use the data warehouse architecture? Or why should we use architecture at all, which may today include a data lake and other things, versus just I'll just build a database for, for my project, leave me alone, okay? That's the question. Why use a, an architecture versus something that's more independent uh, that I have more autonomous control over out here in the project, and so on. That's the question you have to address. And typically, we like to address that with TCO. Now, total cost of ownership, that is. I'll get into that a little bit more. Or is it a project that we use the data store, like my predictive maintenance example? That project needs, needs data. If you look down the list of the projects your company is working on, which one of them doesn't need data, doesn't need analytics? I have a hard time finding any important project to a company that doesn't need both of those things. And so that, uh, that leads me to justifying a lot of data warehouse projects, okay? So this is the question. The question becomes on that, why do the project? Why do predictive maintenance, for example? Well, yeah, I'll leave that to you. I'm sure that can be done separately. But do know what question that you're trying to address and what question that counterparty has in his mind. Remember. They're, they're always asking questions and uh, um, being appropriately skeptical, I guess, of your statements. Oh, you want to do this, you want to do that. They're trying to say no. They're trying to get to the end of their day. You've got to get their attention by addressing the questions that they are formulating in their heads without telling you. The inclusion of new projects into an existing data store program. So let's say you have a data warehouse and it's, it's, you know, moderate maturity, uh, according to, you know, most standards, um, and a new project pops up that needs analytic data. Well, should they roll their own, or should they come into the, the family, the data warehouse family, 
and start using the data there. Well, hopefully you've built the data warehouse in such a way that they're welcome and you know how to handle it and uh, get them involved and so on. And no other party that's in the data warehouse is going to have any heartburn over that. Um, but maybe those are things you have to work on in order to get that program rolling. Now, return on investment. I've been building up to this. It's just simply return minus investment over investment. It should always be supported with the time period. So if you're going to tell me you're going to give me a 301% return, my next question is, when? Um, tomorrow? That's great. I'll take that deal. <laughs> if it's uh, 10 years from now, well, breaking that down to an annualized uh, percent return, it's not that good, really. So it all has to do with the time frame. So you have to add that. And by the way, as you're doing these things, don't get carried away here. I never go more than three years. If it can't justify itself in three years, my goodness. The projects today need to, need to be uh, in the black. I would say these ROI projects, not the 10% strategic ones, okay, but these ROI projects, you better be getting them in the black in about six months to a year, okay? And if you can't do that, then you need to sharpen the pencil. And you need to look at the things in this bullet here by source system, subject area, business problem, solve, users, levels of summary, and or amount of history data. There's probably 10 other things I could add on to that list. But you get what I'm saying. How you, how you break up this ocean of possibilities here is it's infinite, really. How you build a data warehouse the different ways, it's infinite. How you build an MDM hub, the different ways are infinite. Uh, but it's up to you as the champion to formulate to craft something that is going to return quickly and on an ongoing basis. Because today, even if you were to take even longer, even if you were to take longer to do it quote unquote right, if you cannot return uh, in six months to a year, you're not going to get that project or you shouldn't get that project or it's not going to have legs to go beyond the six months to a year when things start getting tighter. And so therefore, even though it may not seem to be the right thing to do, the right thing to do is to get a great project up and running in your company that does deliver. Moving on. Information management program justifications. I mentioned before that I use TCO for this, total cost of ownership. So this is somebody's questioning the data warehouse itself or somebody's questioning the MBM hub or the data lake or the operational hub or what have you. You know, why do something in an architected fashion? versus not, versus the independent way of doing things. Now, this would seem to be kind of an old argument that, have we got past this? No, we haven't got past this. We have not got past this. In, in, my, in my clients, uh, this is still top of mind. We have not rolled out the education. We've not rolled out the learning uh, all the way in the organization to where this doesn't come up. This comes up all the time. And so there's different things you can look at Operational systems impact, okay, you're only pulling the data out once. One way of doing things gets, uh, gets you great at that one way, makes you more efficient. Tools competence, yeah, same kind of thing. Also, tools budgets, all right, you can get going, uh, uh, get a better deal uh, with a bigger deal with these vendors. Consolidating your expense streams, yeah, holding, uh, having to maintain, I don't know, five different uh, quote unquote data warehouses, let's have one. But the biggest benefit to me is the enterprise subject areas. Yeah, you get it done once and you create data as a service. That's what I think a data professional really needs to be doing today, creating data as a service to the organization. Yeah, I love that concept where you, can, uh, where you as an application owner or as a user can subscribe to data and get the data that you need to do your job. And you can believe in it. You can trust it. It performs well, okay? It's organized very well, and so on. These are the things that, uh, you know, you should be doing with an eye to the usage, but also an eye to the longer term. And it's tricky, but that's the biggest benefit of a information management program, or you might say uh, an architected approach to things. Now, these are some of the domains, some of the artifacts that we build as data professionals, right? data warehousing, data lakes, master data management, analytics, CRM, stream processing. There's probably a few more that could go on here, but these are some of the approaches that I recommend for these. And I think you can find your way between ROI and TCO appropriately for the domain that you, you are thinking about. 
So if it's a data warehouse, I've showed you that it could be ROI, could be TCO, data lakes today, largely net new somethings in organizations, ROI. Master data management, a lot about TCO, a lot about that build once, use many concept. And analytics, analytics provide ROI to the organization. Projects need analytics. And again, I'm going back to that list of projects that's important to your company, that your company is going to do over the next couple of years. Look at that list. Which one is going to be successful without analytics? Which one is going to be successful just doing it the vanilla way or doing it with very shallow, quote, unquote, analytics like, uh, well, let's look at what state the customer lives in and do something in regards to that. You know, we've got to get more focus and analytics to do that for us. We've got to get the data together first. Though. CRM, I don't do a lot with that, but that would be ROI or TCO. Stream processing, that's a lot about ROI. It's somewhat about TCO, though, and it's, it's somewhat about, well, you know, if you can't keep up, if you can't keep up with the incoming data, you're not going to have the data available. You're not going to be able to do the things that you want to do with that data, et cetera, et cetera. So you can see that what I'm looking at here is the knock-on effect of not doing it this way. And I'm doing something that's counter to that so that it is in an architected way. And we can, we can argue here. We can debate about architecture. You know, what's the best architected approach? But at least we're in the realm of architected approaches. We're not in the realm of, well, whatever happens, happens. And too many organizations still have a lot in that category. And there's a lot of opportunity there. And frankly, I feel like a lot of those organizations that keep living by that motto are not going to be around for the future when we're going to have to have a solid data and analytics foundation under every company in order to get into the artificial intelligence future and so on. But I don't want to get ahead of myself too much in terms of architecture. I want to get back to ROI. ROI comes in many forms. There's payback period analysis, which is how long does it take to recoup the initial investment? Well, that kind of implies something, doesn't it? It implies that there is an initial investment. And you might be saying, well, we're doing it the agile way. We're doing it the cloud way. Yeah, cloud kind of models the picture here because with cloud, you pay as you go, usually. Um, I shouldn't even say usually. So many companies now are getting the one in three year commitment kind of deals, but they're still paying as you go. Um, but anyway, um, doing things the agile way makes it hard to say what the upfront costs are, but they're still there. And they're still there. And a cost is a cost is a cost. And it's, it's a dollar expended on the project in one way, shape, or form. It's, you know, it's all the people costs. It's all the consulting costs. It's all the hardware, if you have any. It's all the software. It's all the cloud, et cetera, all those costs. And they're either upfront costs or they're ongoing costs. That's it. And if they're ongoing, they go into the ongoing buckets, maybe by month or what have you, and then they have to be offset by the counter uh, revenue that's going to be coming in as a result of your great project. So how many, if you're in retail, for example, I used to say, how many more socks do we need to sell here to, to pay for the project? You know, can we do it? I remember one client we did a data warehouse for, and this was over the course of a couple of years uh, that we matured that uh, warehouse environment. Our goal was to sell 2% more coffee in the concept, and we did it. And you could say, well, William, how did the data warehouse sell more coffee? Well, that would be another webinar entirely right there, but um, we, uh, uh, suffice it to say, we attached ourselves to that idea from the very beginning. And we, uh, so when it happened, a lot of that value was attributed to the data warehouse, as it should have been, as it should have been. The problem is so many of us build these great data warehouses, we build these great analytic data, analytics or what have you, and, um, Somebody somewhere along the way loses sight of the fact that, wow, that was a pretty important part of this overall journey that we took to get to where we are. And, um, and then it kind of becomes devalued and so on. But anyway, I digress. There could be return on investment. Yes, return on investment is a return on investment uh, uh, measurement. I'll show you that. Um, net present value and internal rate of return. Now, all of these, all of these, all ROI comes down to cash flow. You're not going to get away from it if you're trying to do ROI. So when you start to champion the project that you want the organization to uptake, 
You need to start thinking this way and start to back in the envelope at least be understanding how much it's going to cost and where that value is going to come from. Sometimes I will be invited into organizations, I'll be interviewing people, and um, I am just still amazed, I guess, at I can ask so many IT professionals and technology professionals, so this project you're working on, is it about getting some more revenue for the company or is it about saving some expenses of the company? And they don't know. Uh, they, they lose sight of, of the, their project at a very kind of low level. And that is a problem, I think. I think everybody should know what the project is going to do for the company and keep that in mind as you make your decisions because we make decisions every day, every one of us practically on our projects. And knowing that goal is just helpful. And somebody somewhere, and uh, uh, I think it's, you know, it's even wor an, an, an even worse problem when the director of the group or the project leader of the group or whatever uh, does not uh, know that answer. Yeah, let's know that answer. And none of us are uh, Nostradamus here. <laughs> uh, not that he actually got everything right, but <laughs> none of us know the future uh, entirely. So I always suggest to come up with three ways. There is the best case. Little goes wrong. It goes gangbusters. It goes the way that we would like. There's a plan case in the middle, and there's the worst case. Most everything goes wrong. And guess which one of these that the finance group will gravitate to and say, well, that's what's going to happen. Yeah, it's the worst case. So there's some, uh, there's some art, I guess, involved in uh, the presentation of this as well. Um, but it's only honest to present the different possibilities, especially around the returns. The expenses, we, we better pretty much nail that. Okay, but the returns, you know, how many uh, socks we're going to sell, how much coffee we're going to sell, how many returns we're going to avoid, how, many, how much fraud we're going to limit uh, with what we do, how much maintenance we're going to uh, uh, save on, you know, all that sort of thing. That's, uh, that's, the best, you know, that's the best guess by those who should know, but it's still hard. And by the way, one of the hardest parts of ROI is getting – the people who should know, which is largely not us, to cough up those numbers because they're going, they're going to have to stand behind them. And therefore, a culture of ROI in that company uh, is very helpful to me or, or you as we go forward with these projects because they'll be predisposed to offering up some, some numbers, some tangible returns, some returns you decide to measure, not the ones you decide not to measure. Those are the intangible returns. And they're great. We love them. We love to give webinars and talk all about data quality. I know I do data integration. I love to talk about it. Uh, I love to talk about, you know, uh, the graph, graphing data and how fancy we can make this and on and on. We love to talk about that, but we're not con con completing the conversation, at least from a business executive's point of view. As a matter of fact, they don't even want that conversation. They want the conversation that we just had about the ROI. So in order to do the ROI, and I'm not going to take us in deep into the math here. We don't have time for that. I'll introduce it a little bit, um, and some of you uh, will need to, you know, study more and uh, take this forward, but uh, use this as an idea to help the organization do what it should do. The discount rate, this is the cost of money. In other words, ask the CFO office. By the way, always get – Get the finance team or the finance people in your sphere. Get them, get them uh, uh, knowing what you're doing if you're coming up with an ROI so they can give you guidance as to what's going to work for them because ultimately they're going to see it. And so they might say, well, William, around here we like to do internal rate of return. So do that. All of it comes down to cash flow. Whether you're doing payback, ROI, internal rate of return, all of it comes down to cash flow, and then it's just a matter of an Excel function, really, to come up with whether it's an IRR or payback period or whatever. So got to get that, those cash flows going. For example, let's say in this example you're doing cost savings. You're, you're not going to save anything in the first year because, well, you're building it in the first year. The second year you're going to save 60. The third year you're going to save 80. We like to get 
we like to get more excited, I guess, about the possibilities as time goes on. And um, uh, that's why I want to cap it at three years because, uh, because yeah, we, we don't want to be showing ridiculous numbers on here. So you, you keep it real. Keep it real as you go forward. So the financial return here, as you can see, um, let me do some quick math. You're still, you're, 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 you're right at the, right on the border here, aren't you? Yeah, 140 equals 60 plus 80. So at the end of year three, you, you are breaking even from a straight up perspective. Uh, first year, you're negative 100% ROI because you didn't get any returns because you were building. The second year, it's negative 45%. Yeah, you're still trying to recoup that initial investment in the third year. Yeah, you're breaking you're breaking some ground here because future dollars are anyway. Uh, it has to do with the total cost of uh, uh, cost of money, and that's being applied here as well. And the ROI comes out to 16%. So is that good? I don't I don't think that's very good after three years. But I'm just giving you an example here. Let's take that example forward. Uh, the cash flow which you saw uh, on the previous slide, carries over to here. Um, in, the, in a given year, you, uh, in a given year, it was negative 100,000, because that's how much it cost to build the thing. All right, then it was 50 positive, and then it was 70 positive, because this is offset from the actual returns. You see the cumulative cash flow, which tells you your break even, you're breaking even in the third year, not so hot. The internal rate of return, you see it changes year to year. Yeah, that's why you have to do it by time period. Net present value, negative, negative, and finally positive in the year, year three. If I'm looking at a project like this for a modern organization and it's all about ROI, there's nothing else involved, this is probably a no-go. Okay, just to let you know, this is not, not good enough. Projects need to, to show that they're delivering quicker and better than this. Now, here's some other uh, well, here's taking this forward into the probability distribution. So we just showed you the first one. The second one shows a more pessimistic approach. All right, so we're still at negative 33 ROI after year three. The third one is a more positive approach. We're going to, I forget what this thing was about. Um, I didn't even say, well, we're going to sell more socks, whatever it is. We're going to sell more socks. Those socks are going to be flying off the shelf. So by year three, it's going to be 116%. Now, if I'm looking at that going 116%, yeah, I'm going to go for that. That's actually pretty good as they go. Now, I can't speak about your company because here's the other thing that I'm not showing you here is that there's competing projects for these dollars, right? There's only so much a company can do. Now, I wish a company existed that every t and maybe they do, that every time a positive ROI project was formulated, they would do it. Wow, what a company that would be. But really what happens is that you're, you're competing with other ROIs out there. And by the way, if I put probabilities on ROI 1, 2, and 3, let's say it's 40%, 30-30, and I weigh that out, the net weight, weighed out ROI on this project is 31.67% after year three. And I still, I still think that's not good enough to win the day for the project. But if it is what it is, that's what we say. And that's the number that goes on the cover of the business plan. And then the rest is detail. How you came up with all these numbers. The costs are easy. That's a few pages. The returns, a little bit harder, a little bit harder. And again, doesn't come from us. So we need to have our interviewing skills at the ready. So to use ROI in summarization, get that discount rate. Know the revenue generation and cost reduction dollars by year for the next three years. Yeah, and this includes the, the costs are going to include labor reduction by resource person days and rate. So if you intend to reduce labor, which is not a thing that, uh, it, you know, I get asked about it a lot, but I don't think I've ever really been involved in a project that drastically or even materially reduced a lot of labor in an organization. It just doesn't seem to work that way. Now, some labor gets repurposed other places in the organization, and I'm all for that. Um, and, and people step up to higher levels of contribution to the company, and I'm all for that. But just flat out, this project's going to reduce 100 people 
Uh, that's more myth, I think, than anything else. Know the cost to implement. And these are just some little bullets here, but, you know, there's a lot of work involved in this. A lot of work involved in this. Estimate the costs and benefits, expected low and high, and the probability of each scenario that adds up to 100%. And there you go. Knowing what to do helps you do it, right? So you're not uh, uh, scrambling around in the dark and, and, uh, and, and going down rat holes and wasting time. So how do you get that business quantification that I keep talking about that we need here? I said it's hard. I said uh, business people don't want to cough it up. Well, usually it's a matter of the best estimates of those who should know. Yeah, okay. So let's talk about a data warehouse as an example. If it's enabling the new product or service, the data warehouse justification gets tied into the new product or service justification. Voila. You just got to get them to commit to doing it in a data warehouse way. And oh, by the way, according to your industry standard here, we don't build data warehouses for single projects. We build them for multiple projects. So be sure that that is understood at the beginning. So uh, if I can tie into a project, and by the way, it doesn't cost more to do it right. It's going to cost you more to do a mid-sized or large project. It's going to cost you more to do it the wrong way, the wrong quote-unquote quick way than it is to do it the right way. But in order to do it the right way, you have to have a commitment to doing it the right way, and you have to know what that right way is. And I'm not saying I know what the right way is all the time by any stretch. I am just saying that you, you need to have an architected approach, and it needs to be based on real education out there and real thought. Not just uh, you know one vendor one vendor uh, that has uh, you know some, some something to sell you uh, getting in your ear and you rolling with that. Get yourself some vendor neutral education as you go along here. But I digress. These are some other examples of things in my background. Uh, things uh, I'm sure some of these are in yours as well. Increasing revenue per customer, increasing customer acquisition, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. All these are directly related to ROI. And by the way, I don't like to go it alone. Don't go it alone. You're coming up with numbers. These are highly subjective numbers when it comes to the returns, at least. Get yourself on the corporate governance committee or form yourself one to help you do this and making sure that you are bringing people along with you as you go. Now, I'm a simple person. I'm a simple person when I'm formulating 10 projects for a client in one of our action plans, um, I'm looking at things like this. What's the ease to do it? I like easy. Nothing super easy, okay, but relative to other things, I like to find things that are easy to do. I like to do things that are going to set up other things, so prerequisites, if you will. I like to work on those, uh, and I like to work on things with great big ROI to them, and that's probably the overriding factor, by the way, the ROI. And um, sometimes you have an experienced team, you're behind the eight ball as a company, you're behind the eight ball in terms of architecture maturity, uh, but here you've got to do the project that's going to basically save the company and deliver the high ROI that the company needs to survive. And that's a big risk position to be in. So you want to have those little wins going right now so that when that moment comes, you're ready to step up to the plate. Okay. So we're making all this change in the organization. This is the impact of transformational change that we're doing to our companies have to always be like this. The dawn of man just falling out of the tree thud. Uh, unfortunately, we make it like this for too many of our internal clients. We have to stop doing that. We got to warm them up. We got to let them know ahead of time and then remind them several times because you know how it is in terms of uh, all the things that are pulling at people's uh, mind share in an organization. Successful organizational transformation efforts like the ones we've just been talking about require much more than the right analytics and good planning and good technology. That's all necessary, but it requires taking care of the people risks. Remember, at the very beginning, I talked about the four big categories of, of risk, uh, of why organizations don't change, all right? Uh, people was one of them, organization. So let's talk about managing change in the organization. And this is a program you want to bring along with all of these projects. And if you do that, you're going to really help out that executive sponsor to say yes for the project. 
because this is something that you it, it may be out of your you know realm of of scope as being an issue. It's squarely in his or her realm. Okay, so let's let's bring it to his attention and actually do it. It's not only going to help him or her out to justify and support the project all along the way. It's going to help us out in terms of getting these projects accepted. No more build it and they will come. We're, we're asking them for little things all along the way until we get to the point where we're giving them something big. So they, these are all reality. I'm not going to read all these. These are all realities of the organization today. Employees concerned about how new processes will impact their current jobs. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's a big thing. I'm, I'm interviewing uh, companies about formulating a, a master data management project. And we're going to streamline this process, and we're going to do this and do that. And people are there wondering, well, I do all that now, manually. What am I going to do? Well, before, before I take on the project, you know, that's something that I talk about with the leaders. I talk about, you know, this is going to uh, raise the standard of the company. What do we tell these people? What are they going to do? And let me help you come up with some of the ways that they can continue to contribute. And I find that if we do these OCM things, organizational change management, if we do these things, that we bring people along. And uh, that way we're, we're meeting our goals for the company and our human goals, I guess, to, uh, to the people involved. Staff not adequately prepared to execute new processes and technology. That's which staff I'm really talking about here. I'm talking about the technology staff. I find that in trying to justify these projects, that it is much more so the technology group that wants to drag things back and hold things together the way that things are than the business group. I get much more resonance with the business group than the technology group. And uh, yeah, that's just a fact. And we'll just move on from that. Just know it. Change readiness and organization impact assessments can provide additional insights. Yeah, doing some assessment work of the organization. So let's look at some key areas of change by information management discipline. Let's say you're building a data warehouse, a data lake, or a data hub, or uh, you can fill in the blank, probably three more categories belong here, but one of these shared artifacts of data. Today we're talking, you know, terabytes to petabytes of, of data. Here's, I'm a simple person, once again. I want people to use the data platform, not the old ways to get the data, not not whatever they home grew, not uh, not asking people and waiting days and getting frustrated, but having it at their fingertips. I want them to accept the data in the platform, not question its quality or completeness, because it is of sufficient quality and completeness, et cetera. Why? Because we build it that way. And I want them to know we're building it that way. We're not doing what the last regime did. We're not doing what that, whatever that old project was that was a failure. We are doing it in a more modern, mature way that accounts for all these risk factors. And most organizations are at that point right now. This isn't all net new stuff to them. Oh, you know, building a, a, a common database. That's not net new to any organization. What might be net new is doing it successfully. And that's where your credibility comes. Think of other uses for data in the platform and contribute data, derivations, calculations, summarizations for the platform. Not just take data off the platform and run off to Excel. No. Too many times, and I'm trying not to be very cynical here because I can be, um, and I can have a lot of fun with this, but too many times um, these, these data hubs are built data warehouses, data lakes, et cetera, they're built, and uh, the user just can't wait to grab data out of there and run off to Excel with it. And uh, I might look the other way <laughs> in the first month or two uh, of, the, uh, of the rollout, but that's not something that we can look away from for very long because that is not using uh, business intelligence tools, which have much more capabilities. It's not doing it in a shared way. It's just really not getting to deep levels of, of analytics, uh, no matter how big that Excel document is. And I've been in several organizations that have Excel documents that are uh, at the very limit, I forget what it is, but at the very limit of what an Excel document can be. 
and and wow, what a uh, what a risk factor that is to the organization. Anyway, I'll save the Excel spiel for another time. <laughs> now, master data management. Again, simple guy here. I want the organization to get their master data from MDM, not some other way, not a, not not adding to spaghetti code, but get it from MDM. I want you to contribute your master data to MDM. That's so hard. You come up with new master data. I'm going to give you the definition. I want if you come up with new master data in your processes, I'd like you to give it to the MDM hub. I want you to buy into the new business processes to generate and update master data because we're going to create some new processes here to do that. And I'm going to show you how good they are and how solid they are. And I want you to uh, contribute to that. Effectively use the new business processes to generate or update master data. Yeah, I want you to use, use these new business processes. Response to change. Now, this is not related, not, not solely related by any stretch to data projects in organizations, right? We go through this for everything. The small slights that we feel on a daily basis sometimes we go through this. Even to big things that are life altering, we go through this. And uh, I like to say that knowing that you're going to go through this and you've gone through it many times before, maybe not at this level, but you've gone through this process many times before, it's a human process in the modern world. Hopefully that helps you get to the, uh, the, the levels, uh, the, the extended levels here to where you're spreading the word, you know, quote unquote, spreading the word about the change that you've accepted it. So this is uh, modified a little bit from the one that ends in the acceptance, all right? But this is about project acceptance within the organization. And you have users out there. They're going to go through this denial. The change won't happen. People are stuck in their ways. They like what's happening today. Most of the time, you know, they might give some lip service to, I wish this were better. But then when they start to get a little bit better, it can be a little bit unnerving, let's say. And this it's only normal. It's only normal. Um, the change won't happen. It won't affect me. It will be short-lived. Oh, no, I'm angry. I'm seeing some, seeing some green shoots here of maybe progress. Uh-oh, I'm depressed. It's actually happening. How can I stop it now? Now I, see, now I see something I have to stop. So I start bargaining with the organization. Well, yeah, okay, I'll use your data warehouse a little bit, maybe for this, but not for these things. You know. Or I'll try, and then this isn't bad. Hopefully you've created an experience where it's not bad. And finally... I'm spreading the word. Now, not everybody's going to be in the bottom level here, in the green zone, if you will. Um, a lot of people are going to be in red and yellow, and you have to have a plan to bring them forward. And that's part of the OCM plan, by the way. I'll get to that in a minute. We want to cross the chasm. Yeah, people are all over the place on this. Know that going in. These are the focus areas of OCM, training the workforce, addressing the organizational implications, engaging in communication making sure the organization is ready for the change to come, and managing the stakeholders. Now, you can do this, either embedded in a project to support that project. Let's say, I don't know, it's an ERP project. Put tasks in that plan. Put tasks on that backlog that have everything to do with organizational change. Make sure that you are addressing organizational change issues for that project all along the way. Or you can do a standalone. You can have an, a separate OCM group. You can have an OCM SWAT team, if you will, that goes around to different projects and does this, make sure, making, making sure it happens and being a part of it. And this could be in support of multiple projects. Could be part of data governance. Yeah. Data, if data governance, let's not get all, uh, let's not get, let's, let's, let's get things done in the organization that we need to have done. And if you have a committee sitting there that is capable and they're already meeting, you can add on to it. By, by all means, do it. Whether the, the data governance manual or the book or whatever says to do it or not, if that's what's going to work for you, go ahead. And data governance, let's face it, at the end of the day, it's a group of people. It's a group of people that do things for the organization based upon their unique skill set. And an organizational change in regards to data projects could be part of that. So I recommend that you orient the OCM to projects and have short-term wins. So you orient OCM 
to how to 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 making sure that every project out there is taking care of these people issues not doing something kind of general on the side for the whole organization i don't find those projects or those approaches do very well and last very long and have an impact in the organization and be looking for short-term wins maybe you moved a set of people from from yellow to green and you have some material ways to show that they got more interested in the project before it's even built. This is great. Maybe you did some training uh, about what's to come. Maybe you had some chalkboard sessions, some lunch and learns. I know that's kind of difficult today, but um, some, you know, whatever that looks like to you in the COVID area, era. So you're getting the word out. People are becoming more accepting of data as a, a specific layer of the organization not a drag along to applications, not just something that, oh yeah, oh by the way, we need data for this project. No, it's all about the data. The data should be screaming out what you need to do with it for the purpose of that project. So, how much OCM to do? Well, you can look at your organization, you can assess it, and you can determine along these lines how much you need to do. How much is the organization used to change? Well, that didn't, that impacts how much change readiness you need to do how much is the organization used to process change or how much process change i should say are you going to have as part of this project that imp imp impacts how much you're going to train the workforce etc stakeholders are they numerous and is there the potential for them being unsupportive well in this case in my spider graph here looks like that's true that is true so we've got to do a lot of stakeholder management etc are jobs changing? Are there widespread organizational implications? The more of that, the more OCM you need to do. And so, to recap this, uh, today, if you take care of the people issues, the terminology issues, the ROI issues, the organizational issues, and the credibility issues, these are some of the things that I find that they're, they're hard, people don't have the skills for, and they ignore them at their peril when they're trying to get the organization to do what it needs to do. And uh, needless to say, you need to be formulating great projects that drive the organization not only to ROI, but to the future. Now, speaking of the future, that being said, as I wrap up here, and I will welcome your questions, I haven't allowed a lot of time, but I'll probably get a question or two in, I want to expose you to the advanced analytics topics for next year. And I am excited about these topics, all the way from trends in enterprise analytics to measuring data quality return on investment. These are the projects for next year. Um, I look forward to having you back every month. And for now, I'll turn it back to Paul to see if we have any questions. Thank you, William, for the wonderful and very informative presentation. So, William, can you provide some examples of OCM tasks or deliverables, I find people talk about OCM but often don't really know what it means. Oh, yeah, wow. Um, I've given a whole presentation on this that, that's full of tasks. But anyway, like for example, when it comes to stakeholder management, listing out your stakeholders, uh, uh, assigning them a red, yellow, green, you know, how on board are they with the project, assigning people from the core team to be, uh, uh, to be there, I don't to, their buddy, if you will, and to make sure that they get the word in many uh, different forms. Um, and as for, like, for example, uh, 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 communication, uh, I've talked about getting on the, getting a page on the internet, uh, getting uh, messaging into um, the common messaging that goes out to everybody so they know what's going on with the project and they know what they can expect and how they can be involved. You got to hit these people with the, the message three, four, five times. Remember, we're all bombarded in organizations. Can't just tell them once. So you got to find different venues. I even said, I think uh, uh, in the in the presentation, that uh, one time I put a uh, a billboard <laughs> of sorts in the lobby of the company with a picture of the the team, myself and the team, right? That that built this. Uh, it was an MDM hub. And I had a little Q&A on there. Here's what it means to you. Here's what we're doing. Here's what's upcoming. 
and here's why we're doing it, and uh, people would stop and read that. You know, get the word out, communicate in various ways. Sometimes you have to be uh, creative about it. But yeah, there's a lot more where that came from. But uh, yeah, the questioner is absolutely right. People do talk about OCM, but they don't put it into uh, tasks, and that is uh, that's a problem. So yeah, you want to know your tasks there. And William, how do you? What would you recommend uh, for addressing credibility issues? How should a, a person go about something like that? Oh, wow. Well, um, I th one thing that you always have to keep in mind is that everybody's going to assess your credibility based upon their own criteria. And so a business executive is going to address your credibility based upon your ability to drive to his or her uh, strategic goals and ROI. And so if you're talking all about you know, third normal form and uh, uh, referential integrity and whatnot to them, then you're not, you're not building credibility at all. You need to be building credibility by talking to them about how the things that you do apply to them. And if you're on, but if you're talking to a technical architect that's, you know, making sure you know what you're doing in regards to, I don't know what, stream processing or what have you, okay, then you have to show, demonstrate how you've been to webinars, You've talked to people, you've actually given it some original thought, you've read a lot about it, and, you know, this all comes out. So you have to have a constant program of learning in this space. I'm learning every day, and you really got to be learning every day in this space. Well, thank you once again, William, for the great presentation and Q&A, but I'm afraid that is all we have time for today's webinar, Why Organizations Don't Change When They Need To. Just to remind everyone, we will be posting the recorded webinar and slides to dataversity.net within two business days, and we will send out a follow-up email with the links to the recording and slides. Thank you to everyone for attending today's webinar, and I hope you all enjoy the rest of your day, and stay safe out there. Bye for now.